My name is George Galloway, presenter of Kale Mahorra on Al Maedin Television. My name is I don't mince my words. I speak Kale Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kale Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kalimahora with me, George Galloway, coming to you from London, but discussing far away Brazil. How big is Brazil? We'll see. And how big a result the recent presidential election was. In 1985, I lent to a Brazilian trade union leader 200 crisp American dollars. I can still remember the feel of them in my hand. Recently, that trade union leader repaid me in full with a smashing victory, coming back from the prison cell to the presidential house. Yes, that's right, Lula da Silva, the leader of the Workers' Party of Brazil, has fully repaid his debt to the people of Brazil because they stuck by him when the junta of Bolsonaro put him behind bars unjustly and with the tacit support of the United States of America. Lula's smashing victory over Bolsonaro upset many an apple cart. In fact, so reprehensible was the Bolsonaro government that many people who would not normally be lining up behind a workers' party were keen for him to be defeated which may have sown a seed or two of doubt in some people's minds about what kind of president Lula will be in this, his new presidential term. But rejoice, rejoice, I say, because although uh, Bolsonaro was frequently compared to Donald Trump, he was in truth far, far worse than that. He was virtually a fascist, and if he had the chance, he would have put the jack boots on. So the defeat of Bolsonaro is a victory for the left and for progressive people everywhere in the world. But the importance for Latin America can scarcely be underestimated. There's been a pink tide, of course, and we have charted it on Al Maedin television on Kali Mahorra over these last few years. But this is something of a different order. Brazil is a behemoth, a truly gigantic country, which dwarfs all others in Latin America and most others in the world. Its population, its base of riches, real riches, natural resources, mineral resources, and of course its wonderful, wonderful and plentiful people. It is going to cause shockwaves across the Latin American political landscape. Joe Biden was quick to congratulate uh, Lula on his presidential victory, which may have been as much about his loathing of Bolsonaro as it was of his love for Lula. We'll see if it lasts. But I mentioned those seeds of doubt earlier. And here's what I mean. When George Soros is rooting for you and actually working for you in a presidential election, people who've seen what George Soros has done across the world will naturally raise an eyebrow. So what kind of Lula will be in charge come January of Brazil? Will Bolsonaro accept his defeat? He has de facto agreed to transition, but he has yet to verbalize any acceptance of his defeat. 
Will the armed forces of Brazil accept the Workers' Party's return to power? Perhaps more pointedly, will the police force in Brazil accept that? A militarized police force with a great many sympathizers of Bolsonaro within their ranks. Will the lawfare that was mounted against Lula and Dilma, his successor, be practiced again? Are we likely to see further moves on the legal front to somehow put Lula behind the eight ball? But for me, Lula, keep the $200. You more than repaid it with your wonderful victory. Our first uh, guest, because of course, as always, I'm joined by distinguished experts. I'm merely the enthusiastic amateur here is Julia Falmanas, who is the coordinator in the United Kingdom of Lula's Workers' Party of Brazil. She's also a writer, translator, and interpreter. Uh, Julia, a big congratulations from all fellow thinkers and feelers uh, across the world. How did it feel to see your leader come back from behind bars only a, a year, a year and a half ago, two years maybe, three. and three years behind bars, and now on the steps of the presidential house. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, we're absolutely delighted to have Lula win the elections. We knew it was going to be quite difficult um, with Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro threw his whole weight behind trying to win these elections. He had the, the governmental machine behind him. He spent billions and billions of, uh, of reais trying to prop up uh, Lula's, Lula's most famous benefit, the Bolsa Familia, which he then changed name. But during the pandemic, when people were really, really suffering, there was a whole period when people weren't receiving anything. And yet, before two months before the election, he suddenly propped up, increased the amounts, and gave out uh, a large amount of Bolsa Familia to, to the population. As well as that, we had um, the, the, the propaganda machine of the evangelical churches, who were basically declaring that Lula was the Antichrist. We had um, a lot of um, rural um, agricultural people, businessmen, uh, who were threatening their staff with sack, with the sack if, if they voted for Lula. And on the actual day of the election, we had the highway federal police stopping people to prevent them from reaching the ballot box. So it was a very difficult election. A lot of fake news as well. I forgot to mention that. There was a lot of fake news as it well. It was... Uh, for me, uh, you may know better, it was a surprisingly close result. Bolsonaro got more votes than I imagined that he would. That's Is exactly, that how you saw it? That's exactly why, um, in a way, he, Lula was expected to win in the first round. It was 50-50. I think the, the polls were pretty much right in what they had to say. But Bolsonaro's machine uh, uh, basically made that move to force people. They started giving people money. There were mayors in town, with, uh, in certain towns, we found out from the Brazilian mainstream global TV, where they went out and did the report, where you had mayors who gathered up the people who were receiving these benefits. Registered, registering their name and giving them some extra money to make sure that they wouldn't vote for Lula. People actually preventing people from going from their places to, to somewhere else. So I think although the results are actually very close, we're talking about 59.9 for Lula and 49.1 for Bolsonaro, um, the actual, he has a lot more goodwill in society. I think the actual population of Brazil uh, the, the, there, there is a majority of the population of Brazil that, that is bigger than the actual electoral count that will be on, on Lula's side. Calvin Tucker, you're an expert on elections. Uh, recently, again, an observer uh, 
at the Venezuelan elections, campaign manager for the Morning Star newspaper. Were you anxious in the run-up to polling day? Did you hear and fear, as I did, that something would go wrong, that some kind of coup might be mounted? Or did you think it would go as it did? I think it's, I think it's always an anxious time in any election um, in Latin America because of the uh, history of US interference in elections uh, dating back to the Monroe uh, Doctrine. Um, we've seen this uh, pattern, not just in Brazil, with the uh, jailing uh, of, of Lula, the uh, removal using uh, lawfare of Dilma uh, Rousseau, but we've seen this in Venezuela, in Cuba, in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, in Chile, of course, in 1973. So there's nothing uh, new about uh, attempts to overthrow uh, democracy in Latin America. And, of course, um, we've been here before. This is the second uh, pink tide, or I prefer to call it the red, uh, the red wave. At least uh, part of that pink tide is is Let's pretty wait and red. Let's see about that. It's pretty. It's pretty red. Part of it's pretty red in Venezuela and uh, uh, Cuba, um, for example. Um, and the first red wave, of course, um, came about because of the failure of neoliberalism from around 1980 to the uh, turn of the century. Neoliberalism, which was ushered in. Um, by uh, the Chilean coup in 1973, uh, uh, a failed economic uh, model which gave way to the first pink tide or the red uh, wave. Um, but the US empire fought back and fought back in a pretty spectacular uh, form um, using many of its old tricks from the uh, CIA uh, handbook, um, but also this new concept of... Uh, lawfare, which our uh, guest from the Workers' Party uh, has touched on, and also in Venezuela, the extraordinary spectacle uh, of the United States literally choosing a president uh, who never stood in an election, one Guaido, who stands up in a city square in uh, Caracas and declares himself the president of the country and then goes on to be recognised um, by Canada, Australia, the EU, and the uh, two dozen richest countries uh, in the world. So, in answer to your question, George, I'm always worried about elections uh, in Latin America. At the same time, I was confident um, that uh, Lula uh, had maintained uh, support from his first period in office and had generated uh, new support uh, on the backs of the uh, terrible uh, failings of the Bolsonaro uh, regime. Victor Fraga, filmmaker extraordinaire, Brazilian activist in London. In this case, the United States was on Lula's side. What does that mean? Well, um, there's a dichotomy between Republicans and Democrats in the US, and that's very relevant for internal politics. But when you look at foreign policy, this is far less relevant. You've got to bear in mind there was no coup d'etat in Latin America under George Bush and that uh, Lula would attend George Bush's ranch in Texas um, and have a barbecue. So they got on really, really well. Well, Lula's a statesman. He gets on with ev everyone. That's what he's known for. Um, under the radar of Obama, we had three coup d'etats. We had Honduras, we had Paraguay, and we had Brazil. Uh, incidentally, the same American ambassador, a woman by the name of Liliane Ayalda, was the ambassador in Paraguay when the coup happened, in Brazil when the coup happened, and in Honduras when the coup happened. So what I'm trying to say um, is that when Biden opted to phone Lula, within 40 minutes of his victory. He wasn't thinking so much in terms of uh, international policy. He was thinking of Trump. Bolsonaro is a mini Trump, a far more radical Trump, as you pointed out. He's far more dangerous than Trump. He openly and unequivocally celebrates torture, dictatorship, something Trump doesn't do. Um, so, what Biden w was doing was ensuring that um, a tropical version of Trump did not succeed. If a tropical version of Trump, such as Bolsonaro, succeeds, he'd be 
he'd be fueling Trump in the US. So I think when he phoned Lula, he was simply thinking internal affairs. He wasn't thinking um, uh, foreign affairs. Uh, in the US, that both Democrats and Republicans have been equally destructive to Latin America. The Monroe Doctrine is 200 years just next year. It's a subversion of, um, it's a subversion of the uh, Monroe Doctrine, because the Monroe Doctrine was created in order to prevent the Europeans from interfering in Latin America, but the Americans modified it uh, to, and interpreted it as treating Latin America as, as their backyard. And I don't, I don't think that's, that's going to change. So Biden is not our friend, but Lula is certainly going to have a good relationship with Biden, as he did with, uh, with George Bush. Let's cross uh, to Latin America, uh, to uh, Chile, in fact, part of the pink tide that Calvin uh, Tucker was talking about. Hector Rios is a Chilean social scientist and from the Institute of Social Research at the University College of London. Hector, welcome to the show. Hector, after now a swathe of left-wing victories from Mexico down to Brazil and Chile. Are the region's politics about to fundamentally change in years to come? Yes, uh, I think if we are seeing Latin America um, uh, how it's usually described like a second wave of pintai governments, or as, I, or, or as I prefer, as a second wave of progressive governments. And there is a couple of uh, key points to understand. So the first one is this wave came from the defeat and crisis of the right-wing governments. So unlike the first wave, when you saw a massive wave of protest, demonstration and uprising in different countries, that uh, was the beginning of the driving force of the first wave of progressive government in the second uh, is more about economic and political crisis, and there is not the same level of strength and cohesion in social forces behind government. So one of the cards that this uh, progressive governments are playing is the card of economic and political stability, more than change. So that means that the progressive agendas are still on the table and this government is going to push for changes in Latin America as a region and also as different in their different countries, but they are not as radical as they were in the first wave of, of, of of, of the progressive government. So we're expecting a little bit more conservative ascent because they have a weaker position uh, within national politics and they have a more complex relationship with social movements. Given the narrowness of the majority and the constant doubt being thrown on the result by Bolsonaro's supporters, will this result hold, do you think? I think if we can expect some political unrest uh, from social movements uh, that might find that the agenda of government is not good enough, but also we may find a huge pressure of reactionary forces behind uh, Bolsonaro movements uh, against the government. It's something that we already saw uh, after the elections, uh, although Bolsonaro recognize the victory of, of Lula uh, in Brazil. You saw different kind of uh, rascal movements related to Bolsonaro uh, confronting and denying the result of the election. And uh, that is the similar kind of pattern that we saw, for example, in the case of Trump uh, in the US. And it seemed like it is a common strategy of uh, far right wing populist forces around the world of deny the democratic election, uh, that put pressure on ele elected governments and try to block a uh, within institution but also outside institution any effort of uh transformation and an agenda so i think there, there will be a lot of opposition on the street on parliament to the agenda imposed by bolsonaro i think it, lula is a really well experienced politician he's aware of this so he was since the beginning, trying to build a broader uh, coalition to beat Bolsonaro in the election. 
hopefully that coalition will remain relatively stable over time and will uh, manage the capacity to uh, control this uprising. Also, we need to be aware of different kind of lawfare against the government of Lula, as happened, for example, with the case of, of Dilma Rousseff at the beginning of 2010, when uh, the attack came from the street, but also came from organized uh, legal attacks on the legitimacy of government. Uh, Lula was victim of those attacks, of course, during 2010. Uh, he was in prison, so he's perfectly aware of all these tactical strategies. Probably the new one is the important role of rust group movements around the far uh, right-wing parties from the side of Bolsonaro. That is something to see how the government, how the left will cope with these uh, movements. Uh, that was a uh, uh, car of changing the game uh, in the case of the US. So we need to see how that forces are occupied uh, in the case of, of Brazil. As a Latin American citizen as you are, how, how do you see this comeback by Lula in Brazil's relations with the rest of Latin America and perhaps particularly Venezuela and Cuba? Lula, well, first, Brazil play the major role in Latin American politics, so is the major global player. So the position that Brazil takes uh, in the international context will, of course, be a point of reference for the rest of the government. Lula itself is an important and historical leader of the left in the region and worldwide, so also we probably concern a lot of attention. Uh, there will be uh, no questions about a strong connection between Mexico, uh, Brazil, Colombia and Brazil, and, and of course, between Bolivia and Brazil, mainly because they share similar agendas and because they have been uh, long-time allies during the first wave of, go of progressive government. So that is expected to happen. However, I think there is important dilemmas, particularly with the new left from Chile. Uh, there is no consensus about the position that the region should have relating to Venezuela and Cuba. I think the position of Lula as the position of Bolivia and Colombia and Mexico is quite clear. They support the governments. They are against any kind of foreign intervention. And they are not being extremely critical with what happened uh, in, in, in any internal level in both countries. But that is a, a clear contrast with the position, for example, that Gabriel Boric uh, is taking uh, towards Venezuela and, and Cuba. Uh, in the case of, of Chile, we uh, the president Gabriel Boric has a, a stronger criticism against the human rights violation in, in Venezuela and Cuba. And that is something, of course, to consider how uh, both positions would uh, negotiate with, it, with each other in order to create a cohesive block of uh, regional politics. Much more coming up after the break. Stay tuned. You're watching Callum O'Hara with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming from London, talking about Brazil. Julia, you're the UK coordinator of Lula's party. You know his thought. You know his development. How has he, if at all, changed? How did prison time change him? How did the current uh, uh, political developments change him? How did the narrowness of the election victory change him? In other words, what kind of Lula can we look forward to in January? Um, we have perhaps two sides to the same story. Um, basically, Lula is a, a much more mature and experienced person. He went through prison. He saw, saw a lot of people that he negotiated with and tried to make a government with turn their backs towards on him and on his um, the, the Workers' Party and Dilma Rousseff, our president, put him in prison and he was for a short time 
a pariah within Brazil, Brazil and Brazilian politics. So Lula is very, very much aware of the people that he is dealing with. He's also said a number of times, and I, I, I truly believe him, that he has, if he's come back into Brazilian politics, he hasn't come back just to do what he did before. He's come back to do more. Okay. Um, so he is much more aware. He wants to do the social policies that, that, that he, he brought along during his first governments. And he's also a far more, uh, let's say, open. He spent, he spent 580 days in prison, mainly reading. And he did a lot of reading and a lot of learning. So, for example, for him now, the environment is something very important. He's very, very much aware of, not that he wasn't before, but he's, he's, he's more sure about the ethnic lines of the Brazilian population, i.e. About, about the needs and necessities of black people and of black people representing themselves as well. So he's going to be a Lula that's far more radical in certain ways. However, as we have seen, he is also a Lula that is uh, coming into a Brazil that has been almost decimated by Bolsonaro. And he's also having to ally himself with all these people that <laughs> put him in prison, basically. So um, that will mean that he will have to be a lot less radical in the types of policies that he is going to put forward because of the alliances he's going to have to make. So we will have to see how far Lula will be able to be himself and achieve the things that he wants to do, which is a far more radical Brazil, or whether he's going to be prevented because of the, the broad alliance that he had to make. One of the things I would like to say, however, is that the environmental agenda is very important. And that is probably something that his allies will also be on his side. So I think that and foreign policy is another thing. And, and foreign policy will be very much based on, on the environment as well. Foreign policy will be something that will be like almost like a protection for him to be able to be slightly more radical within the country. Let's uh, go to Oslo. Adam Souza is president of the social organization SEJA, which provides financial support and professional development in places like Rio de Janeiro. Adams, welcome to the show. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Adams, now that Brazil is added to the long list now of left-wing victories in recent elections, should we expect a big change now in Latin America? Well, uh, we have to think that uh, the world has changed dramatically since Lula's last administration, and that the Brazil global and regional standing has diminished under Bolsonaro administration. Uh, Lula uh, new administration should definitely emphasize a more South-South cooperation and uh, the regional diplomacy. Uh, this is important uh, for Lula and for Brazil to regain and rebuild uh, international uh, credibility that Brazil has lost. And uh, at the moment, I see that Brazil is definitely like regain the South-South cooperation and uh, we emphasize the diplomacy in the South, but at the same time, we'll focus uh, in a very pragmatic way with the North. Tell us, Adams, who are the main supporters of Lula? What's the demography of his base in terms of age and ethnicity and so on? Well, I see that uh, Lula has uh, doing a movement to gain the support of the new generation, uh, especially like the black uh, and the poor people that, uh, you know, uh, for decades have been supporting him, especially the poorest. But Lula has been working and doing a movement with the young generation, especially in the peripheries of Brazil. For example, during Lula's campaign, he visited one of the biggest favela complex in Rio de Janeiro called Complexo do Alemão. So Lula is definitely trying to dialogue with the new generation. He's trying to make 
I think the new government, the new administration will try to have a better dialogue with the minority groups. I think that's something that in the past administration, the left uh, PT, the left uh, government, uh, in a way, forgot to to dialogue with the based movement, right? The minorities uh, groups that are in the base that give the support for Lula and for the left in Brazil. So I see definitely like new faces coming into Lula um, administration. For instance, uh, Lula, uh, the transition um, government. So they invited Ariel Aniele Franco, which is the uh, sister of uh, Marielle Franco, who was assassinated in the past year. So I see that Lula is definitely trying to create a dialogue with the youth from the peripheries. Your organization uh, fights battles, uh, poverty and underdevelopment, not just in Brazil, but elsewhere. Uh, how much do you think uh, Lula's presidency can do to tackle issues like poverty and underachievement, lack of opportunity, particularly of young people? Um, I think and I see Lula uh, increasing the effort and resources and budget on social programs that uh, was uh, reduced uh, under Bolsonaro administration. Uh, poverty has increased in Brazil in the past years uh, for, and, and this has happened for several crises uh, domestically, but also uh, in the world internationally. Uh, and the, pandem the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to poverty uh, increase and food insecurity increase in Brazil. Uh, at this time, about 41% of Brazilians are experiencing and facing food insecurity. And I see Lula and new administration working the youth and getting the poorest back as a priority into his agenda. Look, Brazil is a big and important country. It can't cut itself off from the rest of the world a world that has riven with conflict, not just the obvious uh, NATO-Russia confrontation over the body of Ukraine, but in the Middle East and many other places. How much of a distraction will that be for Lula? Will he be able to focus on the domestic or will he be pulled into international affairs? Yeah, um, Lula... A new administration starting January next year have many challenges ahead. The world that is coming, it's a very different world, world from Lula past administration. We have regional problems in Latin America and South America, and we have problems in Europe. Uh, we have the war in Ukraine, and Lula will need to balance uh, in Lula we need to balance and regain credibility in the region, but also try to build Brazil credibility abroad. So this is not an easy task. Uh, Lula would definitely need to focus domestically because there is a movement that really is growing. Uh, there is uh, the support of Bolsonaro, we call Bolsonarists, that since Lula uh, was elected, they are doing strikes in Brazil, they are doing anti-democracy, democratic demonstrations. So there is a very domestic pressure onto his new uh, administration. And he needs to balance and make it everything domestically very stable, while at the same time, he needs to get Brazil back into the international agenda. He needs to get Brazil back in the conversation and the forums of climate cooperation, uh, human rights, you needed to get uh, our credibility in the UN. So it's not an easy task. So Lula definitely had like many challenges ahead. Calvin, uh, when I knew Lula a long time ago, uh, his worldview was uh, very much like yours or, or mine. Uh, how much has time and the new conditions 
altered what he's likely to do on the international level, including regionally. I mean, for example, what will his attitude be to Cuba and Venezuela? Will it be like Chile's uh, or will it be as it was before? What will his attitude be in the BRICS towards Russia, towards China and so on? That's a good question, George. Um, look, I, he, has, he has to re-establish himself as a, as a president uh, and as a politician and re-embed the left in all the institutions uh, of the Brazilian state. That's not going to be uh, a straightforward or a simple uh, task to do. Um, and he came back into power on the basis of a set of alliances, some of which are with his political uh, opponents or, or former opponents, and some of those individuals and institutions are pretty unsavoury. Um, so, like all presidents, he begins with the cards he's got in his hands, not the cards uh, he might prefer uh, to have. I think in terms of his domestic power, it, it, it will depend to a large extent on the mass movement that backs him. And, of course, that's much broader than the uh, Workers' Party. It includes the trade union uh, movement, um, other left uh, political parties, indigenous and social uh, movements, as your uh, other guests have uh, alluded to. Um, where will Lula stand on, the, on, on, on foreign policy issues? Well, I, I think the signs are, are positive. I mean, he's already been attacked by Zelensky for um, uh, offering some uh, criticism of the uh, NATO proxy war uh, uh, in the uh, Ukraine. Um, and Lula, of course, has a strong track record um, of backing uh, Cuba's right to self-determination uh, and independence uh, alongside uh, Venezuela uh, and Nicaragua. Um, I, I, I don't expect to see a sort of Lula the firebrand suddenly emerge on the world stage like a sort of reincarnation of Hugo Chavez or anything uh, like that, but... Uh, his behind-the-scenes uh, diplomacy, I would expect, on foreign affairs um, to be definitely on the progressive, uh, the, the, the redder side of the pink tide. Redder well. side of pink. What do you think, uh, Victor? Firebrand or damp squib? Well, neither, neither. Um, Lula, he's, a, he's boasting, he's just been boasting in the past few days that he's been invited to meet many world leaders in Egypt um, for COP27. He boasts that both Zelensky and Putin uh, approached him and so many other leaders, Biden and others have requested to, to meet him. So um, Brazil did have a very solid relationship with Cuba. Brazil had a program called Mais Medicus, which um, enabled 30, 40,000 Cuban doctors to work in Brazil. Um, but Lula has had, um, Lula's a statesman. Lula is incredibly magnanimous and he has learned how to walk among the serpents. So he he has a good relationship with both the US and virtually all American nations or all Latin American nations. I don't see that changing. I do agree with Julia when she says that the environment is, become, is going to become far more prominent than in the past. The Workers Party was widely criticized in the past for not paying enough attention to, to the environmental agenda. A woman called Marina da Silva, who, is, um, who was Lula's minister, she stepped out. Now she, she's probably going to become, once again, the environmental minister. She is, a wom uh, she is uh, an indigenous woman, an incredibly intelligent woman. Um, and the fact that she might return to the environmental minister is, is a huge sign. It's a sign that Lula, that she believes Lula is prepared to go further than what he has done in the past. Otherwise, she wouldn't even 
consider. He, there hasn't been a formal invitation, um, but she is the most likely person to become our environmental minister again. Um, in the past, she stepped down because she thought Lula wasn't doing enough. So again, I think that's very solid evidence that Lula is going to do a lot more for the environment, and that's going to win him um, a lot of friends in um, in uh, across the world. I, I mean, including the U.S., because Biden is, of course, far more moderate than Trump, and he's not uh, he's not a denialist. He's not an, an obscurantist. Uh, but he he is embracing the green agenda, isn't he? So. Um, yeah, I, especially in Ukraine, where he's setting uh, the world on fire and threatening nuclear war. Uh, Julia, to what extent are these things a cipher for, a turn away from the original purpose of the Workers' Party, which, as the name suggests, is a party for the working class, talking about the environment, talking about minorities, identity politics, to what extent are these, uh, as it were, uh, alternatives to working class politics, socialist working class okay, politics? Okay, before we get into that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the geopolitics in Latin America a little bit. I just wanted to add that um, Brazil, the thing about Venezuela and Cuba, regardless whether they are left wing or right wing or whatever they may be, Brazil, as, as part of our constitution, we have a policy of um, self-determination de and sovereignty. So it has been Brazil's um, foreign policy, regardless even of Lula, to uh, not interfere in other people's affairs. So that's, that's for a start. Lula is also very keen on developing um, and strengthening the institutions of Latin America, like, for example, the Mercosur, the UNASUR, and CELAC. And we expect him to be doing that. And, and the strengthening of South-South relations, in particular, uh, relations within Latin America are very important for him and his foreign policy. So I believe he's going to be somebody much like in the past where he's trying to work diplom to dip diplomatically to try and dissolve any uh, possible conflicts that there may be, in this case, with the USA, Venezuela, USA, Cuba. And also, I think he's going to be a force for peace in the world. He's going to advocate diplomacy as opposed to war, even in the case, in the, case of, of the Ukraine. In relation to workers' policy, again, Lula has been very clear uh, that we need to rediscuss the place of workers within our society, uh, especially talking about workers in, in the new professions of the platform, etc. He's very much aware that there's a whole uh, swathe of um, working people who have absolutely no, no rights, who live informally, and that is not just a problem for Brazil, but a problem for the world. So I see whether he will be successful in that, I don't know. But I think he will, he will at least start a debate about the place of the worker in the new society we live in, in terms of having stronger rights for workers, within this, this new world formation that we have. This is uh, when the problem of these dubious allies uh, comes in though, isn't it? The more clear Lula is, the old Lula, uh, the more problem he'll have with the unsavory allies. The more he tries to please the unsavory allies, the risk of uh, disillusioning uh, those who are hoping for the old Lula uh, grows, isn't that correct? Yes, it is correct. But we, we just had a little taste of it right now, to be honest, because Lula just made a speech, I think a couple of, um, <laughs> a couple of days ago, um, where he um, mentioned, like he mentioned in a lot of his speeches all the time, about how, how terrible is 
the poverty in Brazil. And he actually cried about the number of people who were living underneath the, po the poverty line, uh, line and actually being hungry. And suddenly that sparked off a fear of the so-called market and the market didn't like his speech and, and could Lula make sure that he, he wasn't going to do that and how they'd been tricked by Lula that they didn't expect Lula to behave like this. In fact, Lula did nothing at all because he's been saying all the time that he was going to address poverty whatever, he was going to be fiscally responsible, but um, address poverty much like he did in his other government. But I think Lula is far more, that's where I think Lula is, is, is his, his experience in prison has given him far more courage to be open about about his plans he's he's not going to stand back oh my god the, the the markets are really worried about me or what am i going to do now he's far more likely to say no i'm sorry this is what i've been elected for i was voted in by the people and this is what i'm going to do not saying that there are not going to be any problems not saying he'll be able to do absolutely everything or even that he won't be able to uh disillusion some people he will Will Bolsonaro go quietly, no. do you think? <laughs> no, I, I think his supporters, the, 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 the armed forces are also um, sort of not giving clear signals as well. Victor, so, what do you think? Um, well, I, call, I think the armed forces are playing a very regrettable role. While, while they are saying there has been no fraud, they are also saying hypothetically that could have been fraud. So that's dog whistle politics to, uh, to his most ardent supporters. And you do have right now 250 trucks and about 2,000 people outside the Brazilian military in Brasilia demanding a military coup, openly doing that, uh, confronting the Brazilian society. And that's a crime according to Brazilian constitution. And um, so he's still trying, he's, he's not going to succeed. These people are gonna get tired by the 1st of January. They don't have enough support. Uh, but the military have, have been uh, purposely ambiguous. So they are saying that uh, we have to respect the results. However, something may have gone wrong. <laughs> Coup or no coup, Julia? I, d I don't think he's got enough strength for a coup, but yeah. it's it's going to, you know, they haven't gone there, there basically. Yeah. But they, they haven't gone away, you know. They never do. They the enemy never, never sleeps. Mm -hmm. no. As far as I'm concerned, it's the best $200 I ever spent. Go Lula, El Presidente. Thanks for watching. Kali Mahora with me, George Galloway.